10, 15, let us start. Uh, nice to see so many people here. Uh, greetings. My name is Mikhail Kluhich. I am from the Kotlin Compiler Core team. And today we will talk about K2 plugin API. And K2 is here the new Kotlin compiler. You have heard so a lot of things about. And a few words about the agenda. Uh, first, we will talk a little bit why should anybody care about the compiler plugins at all. Then, to understand uh, the plugins better, we will discuss briefly how a compiler is organized from inside and which ways do exist uh, to extend the compiler. Then uh, we will talk about the plugins uh, themselves, in particular about backend plugins and frontend plugins, different kinds of compiler plugins. And at last, we will discuss very briefly uh, plugin migration from the old compiler API to the new compiler API. So uh, let us start. Why should anybody care? Uh, primarily, uh, there are two main reasons why uh, should anybody think about using uh, compiler plugins. The first, the simpler one, is about reducing number of boilerplate code. Let us consider an example. Uh, some uh, Java frameworks, uh, uh, for example, frameworks based on Java persistent API, requires uh, from classes uh, to uh, have default constructors. Uh, for example, here, uh, both classes annotated with entity and embeddable should have a default constructor. And it's about uh, the boilerplate. Of course, we should, uh, we, of course, we can add a default constructor ourselves. But it's easier to apply so-called no-argument compiler plugin, and uh, it will do the work for us. So uh, the constructors are added. Uh, here I must mention that uh, plugins uh, never perform source code generation. Uh, on the contrary, uh, they just change something in internal representation of the source code, and it's important. No source code is generated. Another example is about making classes and uh, their members open. Uh, and uh, it's again about uh, some Spring frameworks uh, in this situation. So sometimes it's required uh, from classes and uh, all their members to be open. Remember, please, that uh, in Kotlin, classes and their members are final by defa default, so nobody can extend them. Uh, okay, and here again, uh, we can write open modifier four times uh, and uh, create some boilerplate. But uh, the existing all open compiler plugin can perform the work for us. Uh, it can add this open modifier into the in internal representation. Uh, well, uh, the last example will be about DSL improvement. Uh, so here you can see some fragments, uh, very simplified fragments of uh, Gradle DSL. So in particular here you can see uh, an action, single abstract method interface, and here is uh, the extension function, task container create, which uses this single abstract method interface as a parameter. Uh, according to Kotlin rules, uh, to call this create function, we can pass lambda instead of this, uh, instead of implementation of this interface. But this lambda should have a signature matching uh, the signature of execute function itself. 
So it should have a task value parameter of type t, which extends task. And uh, so uh, it would be nicer if uh, we could write the code this way, replacing uh, the value parameter with implicit receiver or just by dropping this receiver at all. But uh, according to basic code and compiler rules, uh, this code is erroneous because execute uh, method is just a Java method. It's not an extension function. It has no receivers, so uh, it's forbidden. But uh, a single abstract method with receiver plugin can do this work for you. And uh, with this plugin applied, with uh, this annotation here has implicit receiver, this code is allowed. And uh, we have a DSL which is closer to Groovy DSL. Okay, all these three uh, compiler plugins I have reminded uh, are standard compiler plugins. Uh, you should not write them, uh, you should only use them if you require them. But uh, it's quite possible to have uh, situations when you want to do some really complex and, uh, well, imagine that the compiler cannot solve your task and even with, the, with existing compiler plugins you cannot solve your task, okay? You can think twice or one more time and uh, write your own plugin. Just for example, uh, Imagine that you wish to extend the Kotlin type system. So here we are trying to split numeric types into positive and negative. So uh, uh, we want it to behave so that take positive function can accept, for example, 42, but cannot accept minus three. Okay, you can, you can write such a plugin. It's not really complex. We have such an example of plugin. And uh, how does it work? Uh, here, take positive uh, and take negative calls are compiled correctly because the sign are correct. If we replace arguments this way, then take positive cannot accept negative double and uh, this code will not work. In case the sign of some variable uh, isn't known at all, uh, then both take positive and take negative calls uh, are erroneous. So, okay, it was an answer to question why should anybody care? So, you have seen some examples. Okay, to understand how uh, all this stuff work uh, better, let's consider compiler from inside, very briefly. At the highest level, so-called black box compiler level, it's the easiest one, and here we can just say that compiler has inputs and outputs. As the inputs, uh, Kotlin compiler accepts source files, dependency files, for example, jars, and some flags and settings. As outputs, it can produce uh, JVM classes, native objects, and K libraries depending on platform uh, it uses. Uh, well, let's go one level lower. Uh, at one level lower, we can split the compiler into the front end and the back end. It's the common names we are using in our regular work. And uh, the main task of the compiler front end is to extract uh, the program semantics. Not only to extract, but also to store it in some way. Then, when program semantics is known, back end, the back end can start its work and produce compiler output. Uh, okay, so we are talking ab mostly about front end, so let's consider front end in a bit more details. As usual, the compiler front end starts its work with a parser. And uh, parser generates a parse tree. In the Kotlin compiler case, it's a kind of a concrete syntax tree. Uh, this concrete means that uh, we keep all nodes 
nodes alive. So uh, each element of the source code, including comments, parentheses, and so, is represented as a node in a parse tree. Then uh, we run a so-called front-end IR builder, and it builds uh, a front-end IR tree. Front-end IR means front-end intermediate representation, and it's a base structure for the new compiler front-end, front -end, the K2. This tree is a kind of an abstract syntax tree, and abstract means here that we drop some nodes, like comments, which are not important for the compiler work, and perform some additional desugarings. For example, we replace uh, all if statements in the code by when statements just for convenience of analysis and not to re repeat this analysis twice. Uh, then the main part runs, it's uh, the front-end IR analyzer, and it adds semantics and uh, store it inside a front-end IR tree. So effectively it becomes an abstract semantic graph after this modification. Uh, then we run some checkers to check the code for correctness. Uh, you all know that some, uh, sometimes code is correct, sometimes code is incorrect. Uh, so at this stage we can produce some warnings and errors. And in case the code is green, so no warnings are in the code, we can run uh, the translator. Uh, it, its main task is to con convert uh, front-end IR tree to just an IR tree, or more precisely, to back-end IR tree. Uh, well, uh, according to the name, it's a basic structure for the back-end, and then it runs and generates output. So that's how uh, the front-end is organized, very briefly. Well, uh, then about ways to extend the compiler. Uh, well, uh, yesterday we have a great talk from Tadeusz about KSP and compiler plugins. Can I ask you who was at, on this talk? Okay, not so much people. Okay. Uh, then <laughs> I should uh, repeat in more details. Uh, then, uh, there are three different approaches we have at the moment. The first one of them, uh, the most conservative and uh, uh, with the least number of uh, features is Kotlin annotation processing. Uh, in the middle we have uh, Kotlin symbol processing. And uh, the most adaptive and powerful and uh, also the most complex are the compiler plugins. Uh, well, let's see how all of them work. Uh, about annotation processing. So we start from existing Kotlin sources. And uh, we need uh, a partial pass of the compiler frontend to get analyzed declaration headers. So we don't analyze bodies at this stage. Then uh, compiler backend runs also partially to get declarations byte code again without uh, bodies. Then uh, Kotlin annotation processing tool uh, creates uh, Java compiler nodes and then, uh, well, we are on top of Java compiler here. Java compiler runs itself, it runs annotation processors, and it produces class files. Okay, so uh, the tool performed its main work, and then we need the second pass of the Kotlin compiler. This time it's the full pass, and it produces the compiler output. So uh, we have two passes here, it's bad. Uh, but we have uh, one advantage, uh, we use here we can use here regular Java annotation processors, so practically nothing is required for migration from Java, but it's the only advantage we have here. But uh, we have two passes and very poor performance. Uh, also, the only thing we can do is to generate new classes and nothing more. We cannot, for example, change something. 
And this approach is JVM only for multi-platform language is its uh, large disadvantage. Well, the next one is Kotlin Simple Processor. And uh, the start is the same. Compiler front-end runs and produce analyzed declaration headers. But we don't require uh, backend first pass for the Kotlin Simple Processor. Uh, instead, the KSP core runs and produces so-called uh, KSP symbols. Uh, and they are the base for this approach. Then we can run simple processors uh, written by users uh, to generate some Kotlin sources. Uh, here we can get new classes, new top-level functions, new top-level properties, and so. Uh, and then we again require the second pass of the compiler. Well, originally this approach was uh, developed for Android projects, but it's not limited to Android only. Uh, we have a uh, simple API here. It's more or less similar to annotation processors, so migration is simple. Uh, this approach is Kotlin-specific, and as was said, we can support multi-platform here. And, uh, and uh, we don't need backend at the first pass, and we have better performance. Uh, well, but uh, we still require two passes. Well, front-end only at the first pass, but we are still worse than the regular compilation. And uh, only new declarations generation is available. Uh, again, we cannot change something here. We can only generate something new. Well, the only way to uh, beat these disadvantages is to use compiler plugins. Mm, they have better performance. They can do much more. Well, let's process to them. Ah, uh, here. At the, uh, at the beginning, I must uh, tell you that compiler plugins are unstable. Also, mm, they are complex, and it's important. And today, I told uh, these words yesterday. I can only repeat them. Think twice if you wish to develop a compiler plugin. They will become uh, they will become easier in K2, as you will see today, but they are still quite complex. Mm, well, uh, first there are two kinds of compiler plugins. Front-end plugins run at the front-end stage, back-end plugins run at the back-end stage. Uh, well, uh, let's start from back-end plugins. They are simpler. Uh, they work uh, using uh, back-end IR as a basic structure, and they can modify it in more or less arbitrary way. So they can do more or less everything. And they have very simple API. You will see it a bit later. But, uh, and it's very important, it's, uh, that they cannot influence compiler analysis. Mm, well, in this example, uh, we have applied no argument backend compiler plugin. Well, yes, no arg argument compiler plugin uh, works mostly at backend stage. And it has generated a default constructor for the base class. In function test, uh, we are trying to call this constructor, but we cannot compile this code. No value for parameter name, and it's a compiler error. Why so? We have generated a default constructor, but we have done it only at backend stage. And compiler analysis is performed at the front end stage. It's earlier. We cannot avoid an error here if this work is performed at, uh, in, in backend plugin. So then uh, for which purpose have we added this default constructor? Well, it can be called uh, via reflection. And it's exactly the way how it's used. Uh, well, let's go to front-end plugins. Uh, uh, <laughs> they use front-end intermediate representation. And uh, they have limited opportunities to generate something or to modify something. But 
uh, and it's an important advantage. Uh, all that was generated or modified is visible in front end. So we will not have these strange errors. Uh, also, front end plugins can provide uh, new warnings or errors, and they even can extend type systems as you have already seen today. Uh, well, uh, uh, yesterday it, it was told in which case we should use KSP. Well, today I want to focus uh, how to choose between backend and frontend plugins. Uh, first of all, if you need to change a method body, then only backend plugin can perform your work. Uh, if you need a new diagnostic, so new warning or new error, uh, then you need a front-end plugin. Uh, if you need some change of resolution rules, well, uh, I must tell here that you cannot change resolution rules arbitrarily. Uh, you, only very slight changes are allowed. Uh, and anyway, you need a front-end plugin. And at last, if you need uh, to add some class members. In this case, both will work. Well, it depends uh, mostly on the fact, uh, do you want uh, they to, them to be visible in front end? Well, uh, and in the case you just need to generate something new, new, new top-level class, uh, new top-level function, new top-level property, new top-level class with functions and properties, and so on and so on, please use KSP. Don't use plugins at all. Uh -huh. Well, mm, just to understand differences better about some existing plugins. Some of them are front-end. Uh, all open is front-end, single abstract method with receiver is front-end. Some of them are back-end, reflect and atomic foo, for example. But a lot of them are combined, all in the middle. So they have uh, a front-end part and a back-end part. Well, uh, a bit more details about back-end plugins. Uh, well, uh, they use an IR3, and uh, its root node is so-called IR module fragment. It's just a container for source files. IR file, IR file, IR file, and each file includes uh, its top-level uh, declarations as children. Here we have function foo, uh, class A, and uh, its, its function bar and its default constructor. Uh, how backend plugins work? Uh, well, they run uh, right after uh, the translator finishes its conversion work. We have just generated an IR3. Now backend plugins run. They can change something. And then IR backend runs and perform its work. Uh, to write your own backend plugin, you should implement this interface. Well, it's very simple. You should override only one function, uh, and it accepts IR module fragment as the root IR3 node, and uh, IR plugin context as additional container for something. Well, for example, for built-in classes like int or string, which can be useful when you modify something in this tree. Uh, well, uh, for example, Compose plugin. Uh, Yesterday, we also had a detailed report about it, but anyway, so we have some composable function. So what is changed after backend plugin runs? Well, we have generated a value parameter composer. We have generated uh, start and end call uh, at this composer parameter. We have added uh, composer argument to remember function and to another composable button function. Well, all of it is needed just for composable mechanics to work. Uh, 
Another example is Reflect plugin. So here at the top of the slide, we have uh, some annotation, some interface, and two objects. Well, and uh, at the bottom, we are trying to find all objects which both has base as a subtype and are annotated with marker. Uh, this Reflect plugin just uh, traverses uh, this AR tree and replaces uh, this code with the following. Uh, here we have just a list of some impl and other impl mm, with no all this magic at the left side. Uh, well, about front-end plugins. Uh, they are more complex. Uh, they can do uh, different things, uh, but they are limited. Mm, well, we can generate new declarations without limits, but it can be also performed with KSP, so maybe it's not so important. We can modify existing declarations, for example, by adding uh, class members or by changing declaration modifiers. Uh, we can change some, well, only some resolution rules. And uh, from a side, we can add new warnings and errors. If we return to the uh, scheme of uh, the front end, then I can tell you that uh, mostly all these extensions we need here are run at uh, front end AR analyzer. Well, it's just part of adding semantics. And uh, new errors and warnings, of course, are added here in checkers. Uh, well, as an example, we can consider a uh, serialization plugin. In fact, it's quite complex, so I tell just a few words about what it can do. So uh, its primary part, uh, primary task is to provide a mechanism for serialization and deserialization. So for this purpose, we mark the class with serializable annotation, and then in the function test, uh, we uh, use this serializer dot serialize call to perform the serialization. Well, of course, it will not work without a plugin because class foo has no serializer function inside. Uh, okay, but uh, after serialization plugin runs, uh, the code is modified. Now we have companion object in class foo and serializer function inside, and now this code at the bottom is proper, it will work. Uh, also, serialization plugin performs some additional checks. For example, here we check that uh, all properties of serializable class are also serializable. It's not so in this case, some info isn't serializable and it's an error. Another example is here. All uh, primary constructor parameters should be properties. Otherwise, uh, we will have no way to deserialize them. Uh, and it's also an error from the point of view of the plugin. Well, uh, what can I say you about uh, K2 plugin API in comparison with uh, old plugin API? Uh, first of all, uh, I should tell that uh, the old plugin API was designed in uh, with case-by-case -case basis. So we need something, for example, this all open mechanics. Okay, then let's make some hole in the compiler, uh, provide some extension, and let users do what they want. Uh, okay, but this is a bit irregular, and the API itself is also a bit irregular. So uh, on the contrary, uh, K2 plugin API was designed recently. We have already uh, known a lot of use cases. We can des design it from scratch, scratch, and that's why extensions we have designed are more general purpose, and it's important. Uh, and uh, even more important is the fact that uh, we have now Explicit contracts for state of compiler structures. Uh, K1 compiler plugins are designed in the way uh, when plugin can sometimes uh, break everything, especially in IDE context. Uh, K2 plugins are more safe in these ter terms. terms. 
And uh, also, it's very important that uh, K2 plugins don't require ad additional IDE plugins. So IDE support is out of the box. It's quite important. So it reduces uh, in infrastructure things uh, the plugin author should do. Well, uh, everything has uh, disadvantages, and uh, here the API is more complicated, and it's, uh, well, a disadvantage. Uh, well, uh, which capabilities do we have in new plugin API? We can add new super types. Uh, we can generate new declarations. Uh, we can change all uh, declaration modifiers, like modality, open, final, and so, and visibility. We can perform custom single abstract method conversion. K1 plugins can only replace the first value parameter with an implicit receiver. Uh, we added uh, type attributes. They can solve, for example, this positive-negative task from the beginning. And, of course, uh, different kind of checkers. Well, uh, what is inside the API? So what you should write? Uh, the most important part is extensions. To be short, here each uh, capability, to use each capability, you requi require to extend one extension. So they are matching each others. For example, about uh, changing modifiers, all open plugin uh, does so, and uh, here we should uh, extend front end IR status transform extension, and we need override two functions. Need transform status should determine should we change something on this declaration. And uh, such methods are usually search for some annotation and use uh, so-called predicates, it's exactly the second part of API, uh, to determine it. And uh, the second function is the transformation itself. Status here is just a collection of all declaration modifiers, and here we keep modality if it's explicit, explicitly open, final or abstract, or uh, set it to open if it's not explicit. Well, uh, other extensions are matching capabilities. Uh, so you can see it on this slide. It's uh, no much reason to read them. Uh, well, uh, the second part are predicates. Uh, generally, there are two kinds of them, lookup predicates and other predicates. Well, uh, first, what is predicate? Predicate just answers uh, tr true or false. Should we apply uh, some transformation to a declaration or not? Well, uh, lookup predicates uh, can solve more general tasks. They can take a, pred a predicate and uh, return a list of declaration uh, on which the predicate is true. Uh, other predicates uh, uh, have just matches. So this function accepts a predicate and a declaration and answers true or false. Uh, well, as an example, uh, here you can see all open predicate and it uses uh, annotated or under. What does it mean? That uh, it's true for declarations which are annotated or under annotated. So for here for class A, function bus, class nested, and its member function for bar. Other example of predicates includes uh, un just annotated, it's true for annotated declaration. Uh, parent annotated, it's true when parent declaration is annotated, so here for function bus and class nested, but not for class A itself or for function for bar. Uh, has annotated is about children. Function bar has annotated parameters, so this predicate is true. And the complex example of meta annotated, well, meta means here that this predicate is true if class is annotated with something, this resource, uh, which is in turn annotated with meta serializer. Uh, well, how to write a front-end plugin, uh, a K2 front-end plugin. Uh, well, uh, 
who here uh, has ever tried to write a compiler plugin? Well, uh, a lot of people. So the first thing you should do is to extend compiler plugin registrar. And it's the same thing you should do for uh, K1 frontend plugins. But you should tell them that they support K2 by returning true here. And uh, you should overwrite register extensions and to register this guy. It's exactly the second step. Uh, and uh, this guy extends front-end IR extension registrar. Here we should tell the compiler about uh, all extensions we use and all predicate matcher we use with the help of this plus operator function and uh, this transformer and this predicate matcher. Uh, and of course, we should declare both of them. We have already seen them today. So, mm, well, then the next step, how to use the plugins. Uh, <laughs> here I want to start with uh, K1 plugin usage. Uh, well, first of all, we should uh, declare the usage of uh, Cotton Gradle plugin. And then we should use the second by the second guy, sorry. And it's uh, the separate all open Gradle sub plugin, which should be written and Gradle should know about it. So it's yet another work for a plugin author. But it's for K1 plugins. Uh, for, well, the third thing is to declare required annotations which annotation making uh, are making declaration all, all open. Uh, K2 plugin uh, syntax, which you will see now, is just planet. But we will have it uh, quite soon, maybe in one or two months. So we start with the same. We declare uh, the usage of Kotlin Gradle plugin, and then we declare a dependency to compiler plugins. Here we shouldn't have uh, a Gradle sub plugin, and it's another architectural advantage. So plugin author can do less amount of work. And to configure the plugin, we just use the regular configure Kotlin block. Uh, well, uh, the disadvantage here, we should write uh, more code, but we shouldn't write uh, a sub plugin, and it's important. Uh, well, mm, we have seven minutes uh, very briefly about plugin migration. So, uh, if you have some compiler plugin and you want to answer a question will it work under K2 or not? Well, if it's a backend plugin, uh, normally it should work out of the box. But in this case, please pay attention to opt-in. Uh, you will uh, never miss it because it will produce an error. Uh, its name is Frontend AR Incompatible Plugin API. It has some message like this API will be not supported at K2. Please replace it with another API with some advice. Uh, normally, it's a replacement of uh, some descriptors with some uh, backend IR structures. Well, you, you can obtain this error, but in this case, your plugin will not work under K2. And in case you have a front-end plugin, then the API is uh, completely different. You have to rewrite it by implementing these extensions I have reminded today. Well, uh, short demo. Mm, how uh, this stuff works in IDE. So here we have some uh, class base, which is final, uh, class derived, which, which is trying to extend it. And, uh, well, uh, let's try to apply all open plugin. We add here an annotation. We annotate class base with this all open. The code is still read because we sh should apply a plugin first. Then we add here a, a reference to Gradle sub plugin. K2 plugin DSL is on the pl planet. Uh, then, uh, okay, we have now a plugin. Uh, we are trying to reimport project, but too early because first we should configure the plugin with this all open block. Uh, then uh, we add this all open annotation in configuration. Again, do reimport. OK, 
okay. Now we return the code, and the code is now green. We comment annotation, it's red, and so, and so, and so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all, and we have five more minutes. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will be happy to answer your question, and after the presentation, I will be at the booth. You can come here and ask more questions if you want. Please. Please. Uh. Hello, thank you for the great talk. I have a question. Uh, at the moment, when I understand right, we don't have a possibility to extend a parser. So, no, uh, uh, we cannot add some keywords or something to the language. No. Is it uh, planned for uh, the future or is it something we will never? Mm, <laughs> we never thought about extending a parser and plugins, okay. to be honest. So, so, we only have the possibility to add on a Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How would you use this uh, with Maven instead of Gradle? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I don't know the det details yet, but yes, Maven will also work. Mm -hmm. So it will be possible, but we don't know yet how it will look like. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in in terms of time frame, like if if I want to start a new plugin today, should I do it in with the K2 version? Yes, I recommend so. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we have K2 at the beginning of the next year. So probably the K1 plugin is the waste of time right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to define the order in which the plugins are being executed? Mm, sorry, can you repeat? <laughs> Is there any way to define the order in which my Kotlin compiler plugins are being executed? No. So, uh, based on the previous question, um, is there a way, like, you could have some problems because of that, like one plugin executes and but you actually need I don't know to execute other thing before yes we can have a problem we can have some problems uh, maybe we will think about it in, in future how can we order uh, the application of plugins if there are several of them but mm, well <laughs> I will always tell that if you use for example five Kotlin features in, in one place, you will likely have an error. <laughs> and what do you want from plugins? <laughs> if you have <laughs> two, two or three of them simultaneously, well. <laughs> so I have a question about how does all this plugin API work with uh, code which is already compiled, like if I want to get, let's say, all the classes annotated with whatever in my class path or information which is not per se in the source code, does K2 give me the possibility to do this? Yes, for example, if you have a backend plugin, then you just take this AR, search for all classes, uh, find the information you need, and then generate everything you need. Uh, with front-end IR, it works more or less in the same way. So you can write some visitor in which traverses all, all, all the tree, and uh, also it can find all information you need. But I mean, also of my dependencies? My question is, if I can, can I look at the, at the information uh, from the dependencies? It's not so easy. Uh, you can access dependencies only by references. So, for example, you call some function, foo, and it's declared in the dependency. Uh, if you find this call uh, in the front-end IR or back-end IR, no matter, then you can go uh, via reference to dependency elements. But you cannot just uh, tell, let's traverse all dependencies. No, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Uh, so we all know uh, for K1 compiler, we don't have the uh, documentation for the compiler plugins. So when will we expect to have the K2 compiler uh, documentation? Yes, partially it already exists. Oh, really? Oh, okay, yes. okay. okay, thank you. At least we have uh, K-Docs. <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and sorry, uh, another question. So uh, we have seen uh, you demonstrate the uh, the new uh, the new uh, application type to uh, to to apply the, uh, the the compiler plugin uh, with the Gradle uh, customized configuration, right? Uh, rather than the, the the Gradle plugin. Yeah. So yeah, but in this way, uh, we have seen some uh, stream-based uh, DSL to pass the parameters to those uh, compiler plugins. So which is uh, most likely uh, what KSP is doing now. Yeah, so uh, so in this in this way, uh, I think we lose the case, uh, we lose the uh, DSLO um, capabilities. Yeah, we, uh, we fall back to string-based uh, parameters passing. So is there, a, is there any way or any <laughs> better way yeah, to, to do so? <laughs> <laughs> I must confess, I <laughs> didn't really understand. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we can talk about it uh, offline. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes. you. Let, let's dis discuss it a bit later. Okay, we are out of time. Then prob probably. <laughs> Thank you.